Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we form a highly select group, but it's a pleasure to, to see you here. Um, and it's a great pleasure to see Karen here. And also, I, I have to thank her for coming, in part because I know she has a grant deadline due tomorrow. So it's admirable that she's come here. Um, she comes to us, as, as many of you will know, from not far away. She's a professor in city and regional planning. She has a chair in urban studies and design all over the road at, at Worcester. Um, but in many ways, I would say, even though that seems close, she's much closer to us than Worcester, that her work on data analytics, uh, she's the interim dean in data science, and so there are many ways in which we hope we can entice her interests in the school only further, I think. Um, and, and also, I think when I say sort of closer to us, um, I don't only mean spatially. Um, and in some ways, you know, we, we share uh, in, in our schools the strange um, uh, paradox that we are all living around this technology that is meant to have annihilated space of time, brought about the death of distance, have made place irrelevant. And what's remarkable about Karen's work is actually how she shows us uh, in looking at urban development, in looking at the crisis of the urban city, how, how unreasonable and how, in fact, the very place that claims to be invented technology that has made distance irrelevant is getting more and more unequal, more and more expensive, crowded with Google buses, et cetera, et cetera, as we know. So I think this work is, in many ways, um, enormously relevant to us. And I think that one thing that Karen has clearly done is use data as a terribly powerful tool for analyzing these situations. Her work on her book, uh, Planning the Sustainable City, uh, I think raises all sorts of questions that are terribly important and bear on a great deal of the work that is going on here. Um, uh, the work on you know, the resi resilient region, on climate change, bear a great deal on policy questions that we also have to address in one way or another. So I think that this, this exemplary case of putting data to work makes it just more of a pleasure to welcome Karen and hear her talking on towards an equitable data-driven urbanism. Thanks. Um, so, um, what I, I want to do today is, is talk about um, what's going on? Yep. Uh, I'd like to talk about where we've uh, been in terms of uh, trying to predict neighborhood change in particular. I'll talk about um, a project that um, I helped found, which was the Urban Displacement Project, the challenges um, we had, um, methodology in that project, um, and then how I've sort of seen the light or started to see the tunnel uh, <laughs> that I have to go through in order to reach the light. And so I'll talk about some of my work, recent work um, with geotagged um, Twitter, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges of and the potential of integrating big data and small data, and then I'll talk about where I, I expect to be headed in the in the next uh, couple of years, if if time permits. So uh, the idea that we it would be really cool if we could just understand. It's going to happen in neighborhoods. It's been around for a long time, and it actually originates from Chicago, where a community-based organization called the um, uh, Center for Neighborhood Technology put together um, one of the very first early warning systems to predict change, or at least to understand and monitor change. And in, in this case, since we this their project started in the 1980s, the type of change that they were thinking about was um, abandonment and arson and predicting neighborhood decline. 
And that has morphed more recently into a concern with predicting gentrification. So what are the neighborhoods that are going to flip? And this is some uh, work done by our colleague Lisa Bates in, in Portland. Um, there are a number of different efforts right now to kind of point out where gentrification is going to happen and where um, displacement, therefore, may occur. Um, and some of these projects are working, as Lisa does, at the census tract le level, the neighborhood level. Um, some actually go down to the parcel level. So this is a really rich project in the five boroughs of New York City, which maps um, building uh, permit activity, uh, sales transactions, and evictions. So looking at both um, uh, bricks and mortar and humans <laughs> to understand uh, where is the activity happening and then um, uh, suggesting um, that this may actually lead to, to displacement. Um, there's not much analysis here. It's descriptive, but it's extremely rich um, and, and important work. Um, a lot of folks do this work um, for evil, not for good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not that this map is particularly done by, by evil folks, but um, you know, a lot of folks want to know where is the next place to, to make a buck. Um, and so um, that's, uh, you know, tools are, are uh, really helping uh, developers and capital figure out um, where to go in the city. So we uh, began some work about five years ago. It's actually building on work that I started about 10 years ago, mapping neighborhood change uh, in the Bay Area for the regional government. And then uh, we came back and did some more work um, on it. And uh, this is our website and Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, so we, what we were interested um, in looking at was what happens as the Bay Area grows. And we got funded by the state government, the Air Resources Board, to look at um, regional sustainability planning. And we got 2 million new residents coming in the, to this region in the next 25 years. Where are we going to put them? We want to put them near transit. We want to put them in the urban core. Um, so we want to put them in just 5% of the land area. Um, but isn't that then um, potentially going to cause some issues for, for uh, people that live there already? So this is a young man uh, where his family and uh, 70 others were evicted from this building in, in Redwood City. And what's interesting here is that it was Redwood City um, because that's a suburb. And so we have these new areas where you have a housing crisis taking hold that were never on the map before. You would never think of saying Redwood City is going to gentrify um, 30 years ago. Um, so we, we did this research. We worked intensively with community groups. and. Um, the community groups, in the end, wanted our findings. We got sick of emailing them our maps, so we put them up online. And, um, and this, is, this is what they look like. And so just to orient you very briefly, and I'm not, this, is, I'm just, this is just the introductory part of what I want to talk about, so I'm not going to focus here. Um, but what we do in our mapping is we map both the low income areas um, and the moderate to high income areas. So the low income areas are in purple, moderate to high income are in orange. And what we're looking at is change using census data. We're looking at change in the, in the property and in the, in the population of these areas. And the darker the purple, the more gentrification is taking place. Place. Um, in the orange case, the darker the orange, the more exclusion is taking place. Um, so we wanted to get the rich people on the map, too, um, and sort of change the discussion that way, because the focus in this kind of research has really been on the poor neighborhoods. Um, and uh, that means that the policy folks have, have made uh, solutions for the poor neighborhoods. And we've sort of ignored the rich neighborhoods. Um, and we argue that the gradual exclusion of low income populations from the richer neighborhoods through exclusionary displacement is actually a policy problem worth looking at, too. So we wanted to make sure it was on the map. 
Um, the areas here with orange stripes are those that have uh, been gentrified or displa uh, displacing residents for 25 years or so. So these are the ones in a state of advanced gentrification. So long story short, we put up our maps um, and they, they became sort of a sensation. And this was a new website we put up in August of 2015. And very rapidly, we started getting 10,000 hits a month um, out of nothing, really out of a bunch of press coverage. Um, and that meant that there was um, a lot of um, uh, policy attention paid. Um, and so we had a lot of situations, and we still do, actually, where folks will bring our map to a city council meeting and tell their council members, hey, this, that's my neighborhood, and this map says it's at risk of, of uh, gentrification or displacement. And so we, we would, um, you know, I, we want you to enact some policies now to protect us. Um, and then we've also had a set of, of uh, policy shifts at the, from the federal to the local level. So we have HUD um, increasingly allowing uh, anti-displacement preference. So you, if, if you have been uh, uh, displaced from an, an area that was gentrifying, you get preference then for subsidized housing, new subsidized housing that's being built um, in San Francisco. And this, this preference is, um, done based on our maps. That's where you, you know whether you can uh, qualify for the preference or not. And that methodology has been imitated across the country. Um, another example is the Mission District in San Francisco. Now you have to discuss uh, displacement potential whenever you propose a development there. Um, so uh, this is all very exciting um, and, and, uh, to have um, you know, your research not be a, a gathering dust on the shelf, right? Um, but we've had some concerns about um, our, our methodological issues that happen kind of underneath the maps. Um, so we, again, we're funded by the state. So we're supposed to uh, look, uh, really develop a methodology for understanding the relationship between displacement and transit in particular. And the state cares about this because of climate change, because of the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the idea that um, we're investing a lot of money in transit. Let's make sure that we don't displace the residents um, around the transit station and then uh, cause them to use cars more and then just increase greenhouse gas emissions. So we have to be really careful about it. So they wanted us to develop a methodology. And so what well, we thought, well, we, so we're going to do this descriptive mapping project, but let's also, we, we need to do our regression model and, um, and tell them what happens when you put a transit station in an area. And so that's you know, what we did. Um, and um, these are our regression results. And if anything, even you can just glance at it and see well, this is a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes it's a positive effect. Sometimes it's a negative effect. Sometimes it's significant. Sometimes it's not significant. Um, and this was, again, this is a logit model predicting uh, gentrification. So it, it, what, what we were finding variation in was over time. Sometimes it was significant, sometimes not, depending on the time period in location. So if it, were, if it was in San Francisco, um, it, it um, might be a lot more significant than if it was outside of San Francisco in a transit area um, in another neighborhood. Um, and we did also a linear regression on change in low-income households, which was our displacement measure. Same thing. Um, here we're finding kind of weird things. Actually, um, we have a positive change in low-income households in the downtown areas. We have a negative significant in the... Um, in the non-downtown areas. Um, and so our unit of analysis here, remember, is the census tract. We're trying to predict gentrification in, in the census tract level. And it, this is actually much more complicated. And using a census tract is sort of like using you know, a sledgehammer uh, to fix your iPhone. Um, 
this is what neighborhoods look like. This is what a transit station looks like. And um, the way um, change occurs is uh, can vary block by block. Um, and not only that, but not all transit stations are alike. Some of them have, say, um, bike share stations right there at the transit station. And that's then going to encourage more ridership in the area. The context matters a lot with, um, with any kind of you know, urban uh, amenity. So thinking about what, how connected is it to the neighborhood, um, uh, what's the building types around it? Um, who's lived there? How long have they lived there? How, how long have they owned the buildings? Um, how, uh, how much foreclosure has occurred in the area? All, all sorts of factors that really are not picked up in our traditional urban data analytics. Um, so, so we wrote a book about it. Um, and that's the book um, that's coming out in the, in the next month. And it's really just to point out um, that our methods aren't good enough um, more than anything else. So we use quantitative methods. We use qualitative methods. Um, and we look and, and we show how they tell the exact opposite stories often for the same area. And it makes it really challenging um, for policymakers. Um, so that, uh, having gotten that out of my system, it made me want to go think about other ways uh, to look at the problem. So the first uh, thing I, uh, I have done since finishing the, this uh, research project was move into looking at Twitter data, using Twitter data, and um, trying to see if I could use the Twitter data to actually do a better job of predicting where gentrification is going to occur uh, than I was able to with, with my other data and methods. So uh, just to give you a sense of um, my dilemma, so when we look at the 1990s, and we look at change in the 1990s and um, establish a pattern of gentrification. And then we try to apply that to the 2000s. It actually doesn't, um, it doesn't predict very well. So um, we have uh, roughly 10% of tracks in, in the Bay Area have gentrified. Actually, that's true of New York and many other cities. It's roughly 10%. Um, in reality, um, but whenever when we do these models, we kept getting these huge false positives, um, and um, this is we would predict. So uh, a number of neighborhoods um, that that we um, thought were going to be at risk um, were not actually did not actually turn out to gentrify in the 2000s. So. Um, the gentrification was much less widespread than you would have thought from our simple model. So this, this problem is the one I've been sort of trying to throw around um, and uh, throw against the wall and see what will come out um, in, in the last year or so. And one of the things I've been doing, which I'm not going to talk about, is look at um, machine learning and algorithmic type approaches to do a better job of, of prediction since, uh, so that I, it's not me kind of handpicking my variables. Um, and I've actually had a couple iSchool uh, PhD students helping me with that. Um, but the other th um, approach that I've taken is, 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 is working um, uh, with Twitter data. And this is work that I've done with um, Matt Zook from the University of Kentucky and Atta Purtwis, who's at um, Singapore. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken uh, a database of geotagged tweets, three years of data. And uh, they have, they've, they've uh, um, been scraping all the tweets in the world since 2012, all the geotagged ones. Uh, so I have a really nice little database. We just looked at this time period because it matched my uh, census data. So um, we began working with this uh, data. We, um, we then we assigned um, the tweets uh, home locations. Um, actually, we could do this with most of them, um, but not all. We eliminated the ones that have just tweeted a handful of times, and then defined the home location tracks as the ones 
uh, where people had um, tweeted a number of times. They traded at different times of day, different days of the week. Um, and uh, so we've sort of identified where they, what, where, where their home must be um, through this method. Um, and then um, we looked at, um, uh, we tried to control for what we called power users. So we found that there were some, some folks that were just tweeting apparently nonstop. I think our maximum here was 88,707 tweets in the three year period. So, uh, you know, this is uh, somebody with obviously very little else to do, um, or perhaps a bot um, doing this kind of tweeting. So we had to remove these, um, and so we, we tried to control for that. We still wanted to get a sense of uh, frequent visitors, but we control for it by, by just taking one tweet. Uh, per day per tract. So we end up with a data set here, and this is, in this study we're using actually 13 county uh, Bay Area, so actually the mega region to Sacramento, um, but we have 14 million tweets in the end, which is a pretty nice little sample size. Um, here's what it looks like in just in San Francisco. This is actually not our universe of San Francisco tweets, but actually a 1% sample thereof <laughs> because there are so many darn tweets. It just couldn't, it crashed our uh, GIS anytime we tried to do it. Uh, so this is the 1% sample, and just to orient you, what we did with these tweets is we identified um, where they're tweeting at home, which is the red, or, or a neighbor tract. So we identified the tracts near home. Um, and uh, just to be able to distinguish. Um, and then we identify what we call the non-neighbor tweets or the outsider tweets. So those are the ones coming from another place um, to tweet. Um, so they're tweeting outside of where they live. Um, and just to give you a sense of what where those outsiders are actually tweeting, here's um, a layer with just those tweeters. Um, and one of the interesting things that I got from this map is that they're kind of tweeting um, while they're driving down 101, clearly, or driving on Geary Boulevard or uh, 19th Avenue. So um, clearly there's, um, uh, there's a, a, you know, a, a way you can kind of map out your transportation networks by looking at this. So the, what we wanted to do here, again, is figure out whether there was some kind of relationship between um, Twitter activity and, um, and our gentrification indicators so that maybe we could use um, tweeters or tweets as a predictor, as sort of a canary in the coal mine predictor of neighborhoods um, that were um, changing or about to change. So what we uh, what we did next was we took our um, our tweets and we uh, we looked at them compared to our typology. So we looked at um, the share of tweeters in overall and the share of uh, tweet or tweets. Um, in the, the ones, the, the tracks that we had called ongoing gentrification, and the ones in the at-risk areas. And what came out here um, was that uh, there was a disproportionate share of non-neighbor tweets in the ongoing gentrification area. So it turns out that that's the only type where, um, of all of our types of neighborhood change, it's the only type where you have these outsiders uh, coming in. So there's something about um, tweeting that is associated uh, with a uh, gentrifying form of neighborhood change. Um, uh, just to show you some kind of pictures of this, here's, um, based, since we, again, we, we infer um, their demographic characteristics because we know where they live, so we can, we can say some things um, about where people of different demographic groups uh, go in the region. So this is the picture of where, um, where rich people go to tweet. Um, they go to the suburbs, so they go to Marin. 
Um, they go to the Presidio and they tweet there. Um, we could map then where the poor people, this is low income folks, people at 80% of median income or below, where they go to tweet, it tends to be more of um, the, the coastal areas, particularly on the East Bay. Um, we could map then where the high educated people go to tweet. Um, you'll see here there's a cluster around Berkeley, you see a similar cluster around Stanford, so we, we always feel validated when we get results like that. Um, but also, you know, it's interesting to see the areas where the, where the college educated folks um, are going, and there's quite a few in the outlying areas as well. We can look at race um, in this as well. So white people go to the North Bay or the outlying suburbs uh, primarily. African Americans go uh, sort of where you would think based on um, what we know about where um, African American populations are moving. Um, we see a presence in the uh, outer East Bay um, moving up towards, towards Sacramento. Um, Latino populations, we see um, pockets in Santa Rosa and San Jose, Hayward, et cetera. Um, so we can, we can get this kind of picture of uh, activity patterns by different demographic groups. Um, and then we, we throw all this again. See, I get stuck in my old methods, my regression methods, but what was interesting to me was that if you did try and per predict the share of non-neighbor outsider tweets in a neighborhood, you, uh, the, the, one of the factors among um, many controls, one of the factors that is significant is, uh, is ongoing gentrification. So gentrification predicts outsider tweets, um, and then you can turn it around and outsider tweets also uh, predict gentrification. So the, there's, there's um, strong association, causal order would sort of take more digging to, to figure out. Um, but at the very least, um, this gave us a way to kind of refine our typology. So we had Again, a set of areas that we said were at risk of, of gentrification, um, they qualified because of a number of different factors that were significant in, in the regressions for gentrification. Now we can kind of enhance that with a Twitter factor as well, um, which highlights a number of different areas that we wouldn't have really un understood as being at risk uh, based on our crude, um, stale census data. Um, so for instance, the whole area, uh, there's a whole area of San Leandro, um, actually where there's a lot of brew pubs, um, where you're, you have a, a good amount of tweeting from outsider, um, outsider folks. Those were not coming up previously as being at risk, but by this indicator, uh, they seem to be at risk. So this, um, this is an ongoing exploration. Um, this was just a first step here, um, but sort of a proof of concept. We have some work to do on it. Um, but meanwhile, the, the first um, subsequent study um, I'm doing with this data is, is uh, looking at it globally. So we have, I'm teaching a class this semester with, uh, where I'm sending groups of students to Bogota, Buenos Aires, and Manila. And um, they will all be uh, doing some work with uh, the Geotag Twitter database, um, and then a lot of work on the on the ground to 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 validate uh, the types of neighborhood change that we're seeing. So, so that's that is our sort of movement forward in the early warning system uh, area, and. Um, I think it's a it's a long term project, um, but I think there's a lot more kind of methodological work to be done here on um, on this kind of idea of using Twitter data at the same time as census data, mixing and matching them. Um, what can we get out of, kind of combining big data and small data? And um, so I'm using I have a study right now with Facebook. Um, and this, I'm using it as sort of a, a way to pilot this 
um, uh, sort of new methodology that will integrate these kind of what I call multiple partial perspectives. Um, because, um, you know, any time, any researcher that has dug into secondary data like census data or Twitter data, other found data sources, um, it will acknowledge that this is a partial perspective. This is a biased sample in some way is showing only one piece of the puzzle. Um, and um, what I think the potential here, um, particularly in, in uh, spatial sciences and urban studies, is, is combining these kinds of partial perspectives to then get um, more data uh, validity to address the issues that we've had for for many many decades um, in urban planning with very uh, aggregate data that gets stale very quickly. So, what can we do here? What's the potential here of the big data to 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 really um, uh, to to have a more current and a more accurate uh, picture of of what's going on on the ground? Um, so in this study, uh, we were hired by Facebook um, actually um, to do a baseline housing condition study, a, a, condition, a study of conditions in the neighborhoods around its campus. It's expanding very rapidly, and it's building a little city in, um, uh, in the city of Menlo Park. It's building a little sort of company village um, that will have housing for its workers and also some affordable housing. Um, and be, as part of the project agreement with the city, it said we will do um, a, a, a study of, of the conditions uh, in the neighborhood. And it's a baseline just uh, to really provide detail um, so that going forward we can understand if and how the Facebook campus expansion is displacing folks around it. Um, so, um, so we made this into um, a multifaceted project, um, starting out working with, with local high school students um, in the, a local charter academy and also the Boys and Girls Club. Um, doing neighborhood observation with them, doing having them do interviews with their own family and friends who had been displaced to understand uh, what was going on, um, and then digging into various sorts of data to see, um, really based on the questions that the students um, came up with, um, digging into the data to see what it could actually show. And then um, the final part of the po project, which we haven't started yet, is digging into doing sort of an archaeology of policy. So looking at all the different policies and, and uh, regulations and how that those uh, ha in, have shaped um, neighborhood change in those areas. Um, and this, in, in the end, it's my hope that it, this tiny uh, pilot study then can be uh, help us develop a, a larger uh, methodology for, for to, to, to have an early warning system for change. So here's our study area. Uh, you all have been to the Facebook sign. This is the first thing my students wanted to do was get their picture taken at the sign when we started the study. Um, and um, so our, the three areas that um, Facebook wanted us to look at are the three poorer areas around the campus. Um, Belhaven, which is a traditionally African-American neighborhood changing to uh, Latino more recently. Um, East Palo Alto also traditionally African-American uh, city, which has uh, recently gone undergone a transition to majority Latino. And then North Fair Oaks, uh, which is um, a, a Latino community that's actually uh, very close to Redwood City. Um, we so this is how this this is our census data that we use to um, look at gentrification and displacement in these areas, and so we had come up with the idea based on this aggregate data that these areas were um, going through. Uh, uh, ongoing gentrification, so they were the darkest purple. Um, North Fair Oaks is actually a working class community, so it's orange, um, but it's in, it's in uh, the sort of very, very early stages of displacement. 
Um, so here's our high school students uh, walking around uh, the block, um, observing uh, uh, um, characteristics of investment or disinvestment um, that are going on. Um, this is traditionally in my field, urban planning. Um, we do a lot of field work. We, you always have to go out and check your data. So this is literal ground truth thing that we do. And um, at this point, um, the students have walked around every block in the three cities um, to gather data. And we can summarize it like this, and this is just their, their data, their summary for based on walking around East Palo Alto. So um, these are the, um, the, the percent of garages, for instance, that they found used as living spaces were about 14%. Um, and then they had uh, vehicles used as living spaces, et cetera. Here's a couple quotes that they got from interviewing their contacts. Um, we had to move out of our house and into a garage, says Jose. Kevin says, I live in a four bedroom, four bathroom house. Um, and there are five families in this house. And we have a, a lot of quotes like this. And by the way, I've changed all the names uh, here in the presentation, so. Um, so we, 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 this is something that we would never have guessed from our census data. Um, there are crude measures of overcrowding, but we would never have known that there was this, uh, the, the, this intense uh, overcrowding issue in, in, uh, in, um, in for certain families uh, in the area. Um, there, the, the census data just, um, it, it, it will undercount people. Um, and we also heard a lot about just the challenges of, of, of finding and staying in affordable housing. So, um, so we had, we had uh, interviewees that were anticipating being evicted. Um, there were folks that talked about remodeling that's going on. Um, and so forth. Um, they put all this up in a story map, um, and uh, which is on our website. Um, and here they are presenting it to the city council in East Palo Alto. And below there they are at Worcester Hall on campus because we brought them here as well. So, um, so that that really set the stage for us to think through um, what the real problems were and what were the kind data we needed to collect um, to, to tell this story. Um, and uh, luckily, we're able to kind of experiment and look at different methods. Um, so we started out looking at Google Street View. Um, and we built an app. Um, and this was super fun. Uh, we built an app that where you could highlight a polygon. Um, and um, you could then. Um, pull historic uh, Google Street View images over time. So the idea being, we could look at neighborhood change, we could look at investment or speculation uh, through, through some sort of visual inspection of Google Street View uh, images. Now, ultimately, what we'd like to do is train a computer and then have the computer do it, do it for us. So that, that's where we're headed with this. Um, so this is the polygon we, we selected. Um, and you can see uh, what it's, why we selected it. That's um, uh, on the left is, some, uh, is a housing development that was built in part by Facebook uh, for its employees. On the right is um, this very suburban neighborhood. Um, in the app, you just select a random set of um, points, and uh, you pull up a series, a time series of images. Um, unfortunately, uh, this is sort of what the images come out like. Um, and the learning process here was that this is probably not the right method uh, for Menlo Park, California. And actually, we're having a lot more success using it right now in Latin America, um, where there aren't so many trees and cars, but more buildings. Um, very hard to track change here. What we can probably do is track change in the cars parked on the street. And there's been some interesting work done out of Stanford um, tracking changes in, in uh, car models. Um, the Prius shows up in 2017, and they have junkier cars right in 2007. So there's probably something going on here. Um, but this is probably not the way uh, to get at it. So we moved on um, to looking more at um, 
uh, at building permit uh, data and um, and code violation data. So, so here we map the the all the building permit activity in the last uh, ten years or so, um, and we map where the different code violations are taking place to to uh, figure out what type of um, disinvestment is occurring. And um, w w while we're looking at this, we're also looking at the interview results that we've gotten from the students. And, and here's, um, here's something that somebody found on this block, again, not at that exact spot, but somewhere around uh, these four blocks. Um, this this uh, renter says um, some neighbors have received letters from people who probably work at Facebook who want to purchase their homes and they're offering a lot of money for their, the houses that affects others living here. Um, so we were able to use interviews like this to kind of pinpoint potential areas of, of speculation. And then we went to our Zillow uh, Z-Trax data that, that we've been using and uh, looked at the price appreciation going on uh, in those areas and were able to kind of pinpoint um, huge price increases in the middle two blocks, um, which then you can go into um, the Zillow data and look at who's actually doing those transactions and we were able to identify there was actually one individual that was flipping a number of houses on those blocks. Um, so again, this is kind of exploratory work and so this is building the, building the methodology and obviously we're not going to do this by hand, <laughs> block by block. But Understanding the types of questions to ask our data, we're going to be able to to write some code and do this um, for this neighborhood, and uh, and then um, hopefully for for the whole region as well. Um, and then there's Twitter data. So most recently, we've got we've been digging into our geotagged Twitter database, and we've been looking at the tweets and the user profiles, and again, I've changed the names here, but the user profile and the tweet is, is here, is uh, kept the same. Um, so here is uh, this woman asking, how do we build awe into design? Okay, she's obviously working at Facebook. Facebook campus is right across the street here. So, um, so maybe she left the building and she's a half block away and we can see, uh, we can see her kind of walking towards this neighborhood. Um, tweeting about this. Um, here's a local uh, resident uh, saying, then they have like two black kids in the whole school. Um, uh, so uh, that's, uh, this. we're in Belhaven neighborhood for this one. Um, it's changing pretty rapidly, so that may be actually a comment on the change in the school, that tweet maybe. Another tweet, um, I was the one that went out last night. <laughs> um, here's another one sort of on the Facebook side. Facebook is literally the coolest place ever. They're be building apartments for their employees, happiest place on earth. Um, <laughs> and here's another one. Um, it, which is actually directed at Facebook saying, you hate the, well, uh, I'm, uh, we are inferring this, but you hate the hood so much, yet you chose to locate your house and business right next to the fucking hood and want us to change it, want us to change. Um, so, so we have we so we pulled out. So what we're trying to figure out here um, is what are the tensions in this neighborhood and where are they occurring spatially. Um, and so um, starting out by pulling out um, tweets in these areas we know are hypersensitive, right? And then we can code these tweets and um, and then use. Um, and, and look at their, their relationship to investment and speculation, and then we can actually use that to, to predict, hopefully, um, or at least um, uh, identify change that's going on um, in other areas. 
Oh, one more. So this is, <laughs> yes, this is a fellow uh, headed to SFO for a trip to Rome, Madrid, and Amsterdam, tech marketing pro. So um, this is likely um, to be a, a, a recent resident, a new resident uh, in this area, right? So, um, okay, so that that's the idea that of integrating these multiple perspectives. Um, and again, there's a there's a ton of kind of interpretation, right? That's going into these early phases, um, and. Um, but by the time we get up to millions of blocks, um, we may be able to actually have have something that is uh, is very robust. If we can, that I think the issue, um, and this is one of the things that um, that uh, why I like to come to the iSchool school and get help here from folks is you know that the context is going to change the meaning even of these tweets. So it's not like we can take. Um, the Bay Area model and um, use it to interpret Quito, right? So we have to, we, we, we're always going to have to have a local, local knowledge component that's going to be very intensive um, in order to kind of build these models. Okay, the last piece here that we look at um, is, is the policy. So this is a redlining map um, and for San Jose. And um, this is actually, um, it, you, there is no redlining map for this area around Facebook. Why? Because it was built in the 1950s and 60s after uh, the redlining maps existed. But for some, many of the, um, sorry for the advertisement, um, many of the older uh, cities around the US um, did have, uh, were subject to a system where um, their neighborhoods um, were designated um, according to their, uh, the, the riskiness of investment um, from the red areas that were hazardous to the to the um, areas uh, that were safe um, uh, to, to invest your money in. And, um, it, and this is like one of the policies that we kind of have to look at um, as we're dissecting what happened in these neighborhoods. Um, it's the, the, the early... Um, uh, the early kind of financing policies and and the zoning policies that many cities have uh, in place have had uh, decades of impact in terms of where people can move and uh, where they where um, they are displaced from. Um, so one of the things so moving forward, and I'm going to wrap up here. Um, one of the things that we're looking at very f going forward is that um, is those legacies of redlining and zoning, and um, and then what? How how can we kind of overcome them uh, to really um, move to really address the housing crisis and the issues we have today? So um, so this is um, the the redlining map for Berkeley. Um, and you'll see here, this is our calculations here. Um, the, the, in the East Bay, 83% of the gentrifying areas that we identified were already rated as hazardous um, in, in the 1939 by the HOLC um, maps. And, um, and the same thing on the flip side, the areas we see as being exclusionary today um, they 75 percent of them were were ranked as best or uh, you know in the uh, uh, desirable so uh, green or blue colors um, early on and um, so these these types of designations the boundaries that policymakers used to guide investment to guide um, institutions and banks and insurance uh, policymakers um, have had uh, resonance in today's zoning boundaries. So um, Berkeley has a long reputation. Actually, Berkeley was has one of, one of the oldest zoning ordinances in the country. Um, and uh, even the world, and it has um, it has the dubious distinction of having invented exclusionary zoning 
Um, so we had racial covenants very early on. And that the, the racism uh, that was planted into the zoning code remains with us um, till today. So we have these areas um, that are still zoned single family where it's very difficult um, even to build a backyard cottage, um, let alone uh, um, have a, a duplex or a triplex or a fourplex. Um, so, um, so this is this is um, more. This is really in part um, going to be um, a data issue and a, a to solve um, in order to to really pinpoint. Um, where uh, where are we making zoning designations based on neighborhood character? Where are we doing it based on um, some historic legacy um, that remains in place that we're unconscious of that's sort of uh, guiding us to make, make our decisions? Um, and so much of what we have today in terms of a housing crisis in the Bay Area is uh, comes from what we would call the NIMBY movement, the Not In My Backyard uh, movement, um, which is really seeking to preserve uh, what they call neighborhood character. Um, and, uh, and, and based on um, you know, ideas that were set in place by policies uh, from, from many, many decades ago. So uh, uh, moving forward, I think one of the things we're, we're going to have to work towards uh, here, and this is my last slide, is, is thinking about how do we make data accessible, how do we make the understanding of our cities uh, more accessible, and then how do we, how do we kind of democratize even the communication about our cities so that um, the ones participating in our decision-making processes about these are not just uh, the, the ones means, but also the ones um, that are, ha have been cut off from the discussion. Um, and this is really the potential of, um, of, real, of mobile computing and technology, and we talk about it a lot in a developing world context. But there's a huge potential even right here in um, in advanced industrialized countries in the United States to to be able to use this kind of um, technology in our hands, right, to to inform ourselves and to make hopefully better decisions um, in the future, being optimistic. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, we have time for questions. If you would, if you want to ask a question, would you stick your hand up and, and use the microphone? So I'm not sure how much cooperation you have from the cell phone companies. But it strikes me that um, if you knew the number of cell phones per um, house or per apartment, that would be a good measure of overcrowding because cell phones are mostly held by adults or at least teenagers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it wouldn't tell you how many children are in the house, but it would tell you how many adults are in the house probably. Uh, and yeah. I would imagine if you've got five families in one house, mm -hmm. that would really show up if you mm -hmm. had but you'd need, you'd need the cell phone records from all four of the major cell phone companies at least, maybe right. more, because people in different neighborhoods may have different cell phone vendors. Right, although there might be a clustering, but that's great. How can I get that data? You'd I'm, have to I'm talk signing to up. The, the, the cell phone companies and they'd have to release, and you'd have to figure out yeah. some way of anonymizing it so they yeah. wouldn't be giving the data to their competitors because they're touchy about that. Right, so this, it, it may be that the richness of the data that I want, which is address by address, you know, house by house, might be that violating that. Yes. Uh, I, 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 surpri I surprise myself in realizing that there's something I've been looking at that's very relevant to this question, which is, um, I've been looking at the kind of history of the FCC trying to kind of develop these um, 
national broadband maps and there's a, a form that broadband providers have to fill out that's at the level of the census tract to show whether they provide service in a census tract or not and it's been very contentious to get that information from broadband providers precisely for that reason they don't want to release to their competitors like the exact locations where they're providing service so I can't imagine any scenario where they would willingly give up that data right because it gives a very precise map of exactly where they're serving customers and where they aren't mm -hmm. at the at a level of fine grain you know fine grain level that just is exactly the kind of, huh the providers know mm -hmm. Yeah, each provider knows that, but they're not telling the other providers that. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of a different uh, data source where you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, property data competition issues. And that would be property tax data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I started with Zillow data, which yeah. you have access to, but yeah. I'm thinking going one step bef you know, before that, property tax data. Mm -hmm. I imagine that those are public records. And it seems like to that extent, it's not about overcrowding, but to the extent that this type of flipping activities, you know, the, the, the yeah. volume of transactions in a given, on a given blog, given, given neighborhood. Have you considered or use that data or maybe there are some challenges with regards to how you can make use of public records data? Well, you know, the property tax data is very rich and it's in the Z-Tax database. I think it's underused and I, you know, I think I've been uh, talking to some council members in Berkeley about, uh, you know, producing a map of property tax disparities that come about because of Prop 13. And it, you know, a visualization of that would be so very powerful to, uh, because it's, it's quite striking how much less the, uh, the longer term, more affluent residents pay than, than the newer homeowners. So yeah, it's a great source of data for, for, for that. Mm -hmm. Because they know uh, Google and Twitter know from your phone, they can probably get your geolocation down to within a couple of feet, and they have an IP address for you, mm -hmm. and distinct IP addresses probably signify distinct phones. So you might be able to get a measure of how many phones there are in a household. Right. Uh, I, I don't know that this is true, but I'm guessing that we could, could do, do that a little bit with our Twitter data. Yeah, actually, we should we should look at that multiple tweeters. That's actually what I want to ask you about. So thanks thanks first for a really interesting talk. I really appreciate this mixed methods approach you're using. Um, but I would like to talk about the data that you do have for the mm -hmm. geolocation. So the Twitter data in particular. How much do you trust that? <laughs> so I asked because I've done work on it a couple years ago myself for looking at dialectal variation. And the one thing I noticed was just how weird it was. Because mm -hmm. it's something like less than 2% of all tweets have the geotag, the geotag at the level right. of the tweet, right. not the user. Yeah. And in almost all scenarios, it's because it's a message that was tweeted from a smartphone while the user has agreed to release the geo, their own geo coordinates. So they have their privacy settings set in such a way that they're, broad, they're willing to broadcast that, that information. If, they, if very, they understand their privacy exactly, settings. Exactly, that's right, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's the whole point, that, that yeah. it's a very particular slice of the Twitter demographics yeah. that for this is that, that 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 this sample is is true for um, have you noticed anything like this I mean does it do you I mean does it impact this your own choice of the representatives of, of the sample that affects these what you're drawing from it yeah so I'm it, this is this is um, the, we have to use the data with caution and I think we have to you know 
qualify it. And you know, I, I look forward to reading some studies which I've learned about today about bias among the Twitter sample and what that might be. And I don't actually I don't know if there is a study of the bias in the geotag Twitter sample. So thinking through that is another thing. I I actually you know we we devised a system to control for the people that were tweeting you know 80, 88,000 times um, and and to reduce it to one tweet per day. Um, but as, I, as I've been cleaning the data and actually reading tweets, I realized that actually one tweet per day, you could still have one, one very dominant tweeter skewing the results, um, let alone the bots. Like, how, how are we going to clean out the bots? So. Hi. I had, a, I had a question about the redlining slide for Berkeley. I think it's two slides back. There was mm -hmm. one redlining right there. Uh, in the upper part, there's one red blob in the Berkeley yes. Hills, and I was just curious if you knew what yeah, that was. Yeah, I, 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 I don't remember exactly what it is, but I, I believe it was a. There's a, there is a, a group quarters, and maybe, uh, maybe it's a dorm or an apartment building there. Um, but yes, uh, it does, it, it, or it did exist at that point, a, a little pocket of, of a few apartment buildings. <laughs> might have that might have been it. Yeah, I, I can't remember the name. Great talk, thank you. I, I was just curious. I loved the example of the person going to the city council meeting and like yeah. using the information that, or I yeah. think it was a city council meeting, and, like using yeah. the information, like wanting to like use it to a good effect. And like your last slide even yeah. points that out too. That it's kind of the direction going forward. I'm curious again, given the fact that there's these questions of like what variables to use and what data to use and all that stuff. But even for the stuff that you're already collecting. If you could say a little bit more about how you might like to get some of this stuff out there, I can imagine, like you said, mm. like with the app and things like that, like people would be able to access it. But part of it's just knowledge that like this data could be useful to them, and like what kind of constituents you could imagine finding out about their access to this data to sort of democratize and make it sort of more accessible to others. Yeah, I, it's it's a concern, right? Because I mean, yeah, advocates know about the data, right? But <laughs> that that uh, you know he knew about it because he was in in hooked hooked up so you know i think um the only real solution i've <laughs> been able to um come up with is 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 the kids so the students so you know so the i didn't tell you this part but after we after we sent the kids uh, walking around the block uh, every block uh, last summer um this fall we did a, a data eight urban data science curriculum in their math class <laughs> to get them um up to speed a bit um and um but you know, I think, um, so I, I actually think that this housing lens um, combined with technology and, and, and data science is a great way to get folks interested in STEM. And, um, and then we could build that capacity. And then hopefully then they would find our web page so, or data. I had a, a question about definitions. So um, it's three terms, gentrification, yeah. displacement, and exclusion. And I was in, really interested in the map you showed earlier in the presentation of um, middle and upper income yeah. um, areas. And I, I'm just wondering about that terminology. What's What are the distinctions there? Particularly, I think, I guess, between displacement and exclusion, it, it it's Sounds like there's a lot packed into those terms, and I'm I'm very interested. Yeah, in there is, and I I actually deleted that slide from my presentation, so I'm like, ah, I don't want to bore them with definitions. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in the definitions. <laughs> right, right. So, so it, the. So the, actually, people usually ask, what's the difference between gentrification and displacement in our typology? And so early on, we wanted to make an analytical distinction because people were saying gentrification is displacement. Um, and in the process, they were missing all kinds of displacement that was going on without gentrification, which we found when we entered folks you know, in places like Concord. So gentrification, we talk about as the influx of higher income, higher educated people and capital into an area, so both both uh, uh, money and, and people. Displacement is the forced move of a household. And then exclusion is where you can't move in or you're losing um, 
low-income households. So you have this process. I mean, a lot of actually, even the North Berkeley Hills um, were more diverse 20 years ago. And over time, um, as, the, as folks age and die out, <laughs> um, bless them, um, nobody can, the people of the same income level can't move into those areas, right? So that, that succession process is actually resulting in exclusionary displacement. Um, there's another data source you haven't mentioned and only applies to Berkeley, I think, which is uh, the rent board. The rents in Berkeley for multifamily dwelling units are registered annually. Yeah. And so, and I think they have the complete record going back 20 years. Mm -hmm. So that might prove an interesting and they may have data on evictions as well, because yep. there's a just cause eviction ordinance. Yeah, so we have their data. We have the data on rents and evictions. We have it for Berkeley. We have it for Santa Monica. And um, so we are doing some actually a little machine learning task to sort of look at the relationship between and train train the computers. And then we're we're looking at we're we're using it to sort of train uh, to train uh, to to be able to say something about the of rent control and stabilizing communities. So that's another project. Uh, thank you for your talk. Yeah. Um, last semester, Alexis Madrigal, a journalist for The Atlantic, gave a lecture about how data, statistics, the rhetoric of blight were used to displace families in post-World War II West Oakland. So my question is kind of the flip of Coy's question and about the archaeology of politics. Yeah. But can you elaborate on your fears of how the urban displacement project data can be used by individuals, you mentioned flipping homes, or by companies to, for nefarious reasons for, to perpetuate inequities, and the kind, of, uh, yeah. the kind of safeguards that you can put into your data for, to, to protect against this. Yeah, yeah that's, that's such a great question and such a hard question. You know, when we put up our maps in 2015, um, and the Chronicle did a story on them, and the very first phone call we had was from a real estate broker in San Francisco saying, hey, we want to highlight your maps on our website. People are going to love this. <laughs> They'll know where to buy. Um, and we said, no thanks. Um, so, uh, so, but it's, yeah, it, it's, um, it, it's, we, we've had this problem, actually, over time. If you, if you did a media search on mentions of the Urban Displacement Project, you would see that we are equally cited by people that think um, building new housing is good and building new housing is bad. Uh, and, and that, you know, I blame actually on the imprecision of our data, and that's why I've sort of gotten into looking at other ways of, of analyzing the problem, because, you know, we, we have these huge areas, these vast expanses of time. Our analysis is from 1990 to 2015 on 30 block areas, and we can't say anything about what's going to happen on your block, but people will use our data to oppose a development across the street. So I think when we get to this more, or once we start to integrate different types of data and more fine-grained data, we're going to actually get more kind of on-the-ground truthiness. That's my hope. And then we can kind of overcome this issue of people misusing our, our work for evil. Hi. Um, I had a question kind of on the sources you mentioned in addition to Twitter, I believe you said something about um, maybe analyzing blogs, but is there anything else you've looked at, like maybe online comments or some other way of getting at what people are saying about these issues in their neighborhoods or in these yeah, areas? One, well, the, the simplest one actually was that um, Facebook, the, the, the East Palo Alto has a Facebook page of the residents post regularly, so we we've we got invited to it's a closed page so we got invited to it and now we're able to kind of track um track that way um but there's um there's just there's a lot more potential right to pick up chatter around uh, uh you know in in different ways actually i recently gave the twitter talk somewhere and people were like Whoa, why are you doing twitter that is so like 
2010. <laughs> you should be using Instagram. Um, so, and but but there, there's a really good point there, right? That these platforms are shifting continuously, and um, that again is why old people should not, you know, middle-aged professors shouldn't be doing this work by themselves, but rather with students to tell them what platform is is hip. So that didn't quite answer your question, but. Ken, thanks very much. This has been a great talk. I, I wanted, I, what I admired very much along, well, in some ways being terrified with the findings, but was the sort of trajectory from the data at first, which seemed very crude, to refining it and, and the sort mm -hmm. of qualitative, quantitative mix. But I, I wondered if, if looking back at those early findings, I mean, was your sense just that the data was crude or was it actually misleading? Was it, I mean, it seems to me those are two mm -hmm. different characteristics that perhaps need pulling apart in some mm -hmm. way. Yeah, or, well, or is it, or is it both? Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, so, I, yeah, so people, it's misleading because, well, people, people use it for whatever they want it to, they can. There's all this room for ambiguity, too. And some people have been actually really upset at our work because, you know, we say, hey, half of the neighborhoods in the region are at risk. And that creates this sort of climate of fear and paranoia. And then, you know, to go back and say, well, actually, it's more like 5%. <laughs> <laughs> Probably um, it is is very it, you know so I guess it, you know it is, it is misleading. I mean maybe they are at risk. It's just not tomorrow. They're at risk in twenty years or thirty years. Um, so then how do you tell that story? And how are you know that's where we need mechanisms that are not so crude. You know to 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 so people know I am at risk in twenty fifty or I am at risk tomorrow. Um, but maybe with luck, you bankrupt some of the realtors who took your data in the <laughs> early days, so you can see it's a positive effect. Um, is there a question or a sequence of questions that you wished that you wished you could ask that you don't have a good way of getting the answer to? And I'm thinking more broadly in terms of the idea that what we're truly ultimately trying to do on a regional basis is drive policy in some level. Yeah, we want your right. data to sort of match up with, in some good quality way to inform policy. Yeah. And didn't, you know, what, I, you know what's a, what are the sorts of questions you're being asked or, or people yeah. are asking you to sort of interrogate your data to, to find out? Yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, just going back to the very, you know, where I started with this study, um, we, we're by, uh, being asked all the time, should we build a transit station in this neighborhood or not. And, um, and people hate my answer, which is, it depends. <laughs> and, um, but it really, really depends on the micro context around the station and the history and the stability of the community. Um, and, um, you know, so what, what we end up in, in the book that we just wrote, we ended up saying, it depends, but it doesn't matter. We still want to protect our communities, right? So, it, it, so in the end, you can kind of divorce the analysis from the action that needs to be taken. Well, maybe, but in the meantime, you know, you have the, at the state level a number of, a bunch of legislation going through that's affecting that yeah. one way or the other. Yeah. So, so that's, it's becoming, by de facto, they're, they're, they're shaping right. policy to either it's real time. encourage or discourage transit-oriented development. Yeah, so. yeah, and all of that policy really needs to acknowledge the potential for displacement. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, let me thank you very much, Karen. Uh, great talk. Oh, great thank thank you. you for coming.